Hi, so we've recently seen the return once again of I'm not a celebrity, get me in there, whatever it's called, on our TV screens. So in this video, I'm going to explain my opinion as a professional exotic animal keeper on their use of animals in their challenges and their live TV programmes that they put out. So, welcome to this week's Owl Diary! Welcome back to the channel. The Owl Diary is a weekly vlog that I put out as a professional falconer and exotic animal keeper. We provide school visits and we offer animals for parties and special events and outdoor shows and things like that. And, as I said in the introduction, I'm a celebrity, want to get paid more, or whatever it's called, is back on the screens. Personally, I don't watch it anymore, I don't even have a TV licence. However, I know it's on, I've been seeing clips on YouTube. Now, it has changed over the years in its format. They don't use live animals quite as often as they did. But one of the things we do see quite a lot of are insects and the use of insects in the trials. Here I have a coconut shy, but if you watch what pops into my hand, we have some delicious Madagascan hissing cockroaches. I'm not going to eat them, don't worry. Essentially, these are much bigger and chunkier than the cockroaches that are used in the program. They generally use lobster cockroaches, which I used to breed for food for reptiles to eat. But they became an absolute nightmare. They breed incredibly quickly. And even when you get rid of them, you keep lifting things off shelves and you find some small ones under there. They are quite difficult to get rid of once you've had them. They also use reptiles as well, namely snakes. And they only use, of course, constrictor snakes, which don't have any venom. Now, the general conception from these celebrities on the programme and, in fact, from viewers, from most viewers, is that these animals are dangerous and they're scary. And actually, largely these creatures are misunderstood. Firstly, the producers are not going to put anything that's particularly dangerous in with these celebrities. They know that even if someone does get a small bite or scratch, it's going to be quite mild and something that will happen on a very rare occasion every now and then, and something they can easily treat with some basic first aid. I have noticed from the clips that I've seen on YouTube that they have actually moved, of course, from Australia to this castle in Wales over the last couple of years, for obvious reasons. And I've also noticed very quickly, as anyone who keeps reptiles would, that suddenly they went from using things like carpet pythons, like our Dennis, who's a, a beautiful snake from Australia, to using things like corn snakes and royal pythons, which are actually from America and royal pythons from Africa, but they're more commonly found as pets in the UK. So we've gone from looking at very typical Australian pet snakes to very suddenly very typical British pet snakes. Now, do I mind them using the animals in the trials? Well, firstly, insects are not the same as an animal with a spine. Invertebrates are not considered to have the same emotional responses and pain responses when they are injured than anything with a spine does. So actually, insects, they're not so bad. Pour them onto people, if you like. It doesn't really matter too much. And I do include arachnids in that as well, like the spiders. OK, if any of those creatures are accidentally killed, it isn't really very nice. We like to protect the animals as much as possible, but they are only insects and bugs. So in that respect, it isn't quite as bad from an animal welfare point of view. Then it comes on to the vertebrae creatures. They've used different reptiles before, snakes and even large birds and some mammals. And these are very different animals that can get nervous and upset very quickly. But I am pretty confident they use very tame animals on set, things that have been hand-reared and they're really used to people. And that's quite evident, actually, from watching the clips and even the programmes I used to watch back in the day, that these animals actually aren't particularly scared. They're very much used to people running around and things like that. So placing someone, for example, in a box like a coffin and popping a lot of snakes in there. If those snakes are used to being handled, I can't see there being a big issue with them slithering around over someone lying there. So as long as the animals are treated well and well cared for, and care and attention is put into looking at how those animals are dealt with, and I know that they use far less animals 
than they used to, then I suppose it's okay. I've never really seen anything on there anyway that's alarmed me. And of course, I have done work with TV companies before, including ITV, and I know how stringent they are on their animal welfare policies. They're very, very careful because even though they like to think they care about the animals, it's also very important for their reputation. They don't want too many complaints coming in, of course. So they're not going to be silly enough to put out something that really is detrimentally damaging to the animal, something that's really quite severe. But if you're enjoying I Used to Be a Celebrity, Get Me More Work, or again, whatever it's called, then please do watch it. It's very much up to you. And hopefully we won't see too much controversy with their use of animals as long as no one perhaps gets swallowed whole by an anaconda or something, we should be absolutely fine. Right, loads more to see in this week's Owl Diary. Keep watching, there's some really interesting things coming up. So last night I had a dream. Not too unusual, I sometimes have dreams and sometimes remember them. This particular dream wasn't too unusual. This is the sort of dream I have maybe twice, three times a year if I'm lucky, where I'm walking around somewhere, I notice someone's bird of prey, a lost bird of prey, and I'm able to very easily catch it and return it to the owner. Well, perhaps I am psychic because today that actually happened and the dream was very similar in a very peculiar way to what just took place. So about an hour ago, I took a look on the old social media and I saw this photograph. In fact, there were a few photographs of an owl sat on the road and then on the path next to it in the evening, about half past eight, nine o'clock in the evening, something like that. And I could see it was an eagle owl. Couldn't tell how big it was there, which species. So I jumped in the car, grabbed a glove, and headed out there, about a three minute drive away from where I live. Slowly approaching, I spotted the owl. I was able to very slowly get out and pick the owl up. Luckily, he is wearing one jest, it's the leather strap here, just one. The other anklet's fallen off at some point. I don't know how long he's been free for, but he's got a nice chunky keel. That's the bone on the front of the chest there. Nice and meaty, so not underweight, although I will weigh him shortly just to check how he is. And he is a small male Indian eagle owl, Bengal eagle owl, as they're known. So not native to this country, clearly hand reared, clearly very tame. And I'm pleased to say that the owner is actually on his way right now to collect him. Because where I live, it's a, a nice little community. It's easy enough for people to trace the bird, but he is wearing a ring. And if he is registered with the IBR, the Independent Bird Register, then I could use that number to help return the bird to its owner. Something I've done in the past with barn owls, and tawny owls and harris hawks so this is another one to add to the list uh, the ability to help a fellow falconer when they've lost a bird absolutely beautiful bird stunning bird feather condition is just wonderful really tame i assume got out of his aviary perhaps i'll know more and i'm about to update you shortly because the owner's on his way so yes we're going to get you home to where you belong well, I'm pleased to say the son of the owner of the bird has just come to pick him up. His name is Spud, and he's about five years old. This owl is in an aviary during the night, often during the day he's hand dug, and he was on his wooden block perch outside three days ago and has somehow gotten free. When you're tethering birds, and you're using leather especially, as opposed to the braided equipment, it's really important to regularly check the jesses, the leash, the swivel, all that furniture to make sure that nothing's breaking. Because if one jesse breaks on one leg and the bird starts baiting, that's when it's trying to fly, the other one can easily break as well. And therefore it's got to be very, you've got to be very meticulous about that kind of thing and very careful. Little simple mistake that I'm sure they'll learn from. I've offered to make anklets and jesses. They've taken me up on that offer. I'll be bringing around that owl and some others that they keep to fit some new anklets on because I can make measure up the leather and get some nice new anklets and make some jesses for them as well. And the funny thing is, I am aware of the particular bungalow where this owl lives. It's actually quite close to my children's school and I've heard it hooting before in their back garden. So I know exactly where it's from. It is a small world in some ways that we live in, isn't it? But it's good news for that little random rescue of the owl sat on the pavement three days loose and luckily recovered safe and well and now back with the owner. The joys of falconry, it's never ending and I love it.
So we're here with Boris, our boa constrictor. He's about eight years old. Emily here is holding him at the moment. And over the last few months, we've noticed the odd strange moment with him. A bit of bubbling at the mouth. There was one occasion about four or five weeks ago where he was suddenly very limp. He was sort of paralyzed for about 10, 20 seconds and he sort of sprung to life. So we took him to the vets recently and we've got some medication we're gonna administer very shortly. Now, when it comes to exotic animals and birds of prey, you can't just take them to the regular vets. So we have to use specialist vets. In fact, between where I live and where the vets are, we are probably other, many other vets, veterinary practices, but we use Battle Flats, Stamford Bridge. It's a good hour's drive away, but there they have the specialist vets with their know-how and their qualifications in all kinds of exotic animals, including reptiles. So we took him down there he was examined and the prognosis is that there's the start of a respiratory infection. Now these are actually quite a common problem you can get with snakes. Normally a wheezing sound from their breathing, in his case dribbling a little bit, that paralysed moment may be something to do with it. So she's actually given me some antibiotics to administer and this is the second dose he's going to receive. It's an injection once every three days for two weeks and we have to keep them as warm as possible as well to help that medicine actually get round properly. Now when I was asked have you ever injected a snake before by the vet I was able to say yes I have so it's something I've done before and we're going to show you now <clears throat> how we're going to do it. So the first thing is to mention where we're going to inject. We're going to do the first half of the body here, the first third rather. So this kind of section here and just under the skin. So the first thing to do is to make sure the skin is nice and clean. So I'm going to go in just around here in between these two markings on the scales and I'm just going to give that area a nice little clean down just to make sure it's super super clean there. I'll just dry it off. Where are we? There we are. Okay. This is the area we've cleaned here. We're going to go just under the skin. So we just inject like so, straight in there. Simple as that. Check it's not bleeding. Check for any blood in the needle. That looks absolutely fine. And it really is as simple as that. He's got a checkup again in two weeks, just over two weeks' time, and hopefully the symptoms are clear. But essentially, the vet said we caught it early. It's a very really early onset of a respiratory infection. So it's something to look at and monitor very carefully, but we're confident that Boris is going to be absolutely fine. Right, that's it, Boris. Another dose in about three days' time. Hi everyone, I think you can just about see me. There's just enough light coming through to see my little face there. Well, I've come out here in the dark and the cold and the, well, not wet at the minute, but rather blustery weather, just to check on the birds. They're all absolutely fine. This is the advantage of having them on site where I live. I can come out and check on them whenever I like. You can hear the barn owl speaking to me there next door. I thought I'd quickly sneak in the random question of the week. The random question of the week. So this week's question is simply, are the birds okay sat doing nothing? We get that kind of question in different formats on a regular basis, and it refers to the birds on their perches, be it the bow perches or the block perches when they're on displays. And essentially the answer is, of course, yes, we wouldn't be tethering them to perches to sit there for sometimes hours at a time if they weren't happy with it. The reason for that is that birds of prey, like most predators, like to sit and rest as much as possible. It's the best way to survive because when you fly, it takes up energy and hunting is a risky, dangerous business and you've got to have that energy to actually hunt. Therefore, sitting and resting and keeping a good eye, being vigilant all the time, is mostly what a bird of prey's job is. So most birds of prey are absolutely fine to be tethered, like the ones we have, and we of course do handle them and fly them free on a regular basis as well. So I hope that makes sense for you, and tune in to next week's Owl Diary to find out the next random question as well. So there's a storm brewing, it's very very windy, we've got amber and 
I think, even red warnings of wind. So Henrietta here is about to go in a box overnight. The smaller owls and their very new aviaries will be fine. They've got lots of protection. But until we get these bigger aviaries constructed, I'm not leaving them out in this weather. It's something to be very careful of when it is stormy and windy, even if you've got very well-made aviaries and enclosures. So we want to be careful. We want to get, we want to get sucked off. So we're going to go into the box overnight and that'll be much better. Hope you've enjoyed this week's rather full, meaty and bizarre and interesting Owl Diary. And thanks, as always, for watching. Bye for now.